Wow. Welcome back. Let's see if I can get around here without knocking the camera over. Family Bible time. <laughs> we are in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28, 29 and 30. Three chapters, three amazing chapters in Isaiah. Um, and we're going to have to do a little bit of work to understand these because um, this is actually this is material today which if only people understood it rightly it would transform lives for many in, in the church today um, it, people take stuff from these chapters and misuse it terribly um, now the theme of this whole section from chapter 28 really all the way to chapter 35 is um, the is, is really just a whole collection of woes. Um, if you see verse 1 of chapter 28 it starts with the word ah and yet actually that could be translated woe um, and, and the idea here is there's a whole um, series of pronouncements of judgment upon uh, both Ephraim, that's Israel, and upon Jerusalem. Um, and, and, and the whole idea is really the folly of trusting in, in nations. That's what the, the Jews were doing. They were trusting in the nations around them rather than trusting in their God, in Yahweh. So we're going to learn from that. But now in chapter 28, we've got some remarkable information which is going to crop up in 1 Corinthians and has to do with the gift of tongues in the church. And you say, what has Isaiah chapter 28 got to do with the use of gift, the gift mm -hmm. of tongues? Well, we will see. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to understand your word. Please teach us. Please correct us. Help us. Please give us strength and insight into your truth, we pray. And um, help me, I pray, to function uh, physically, mentally, whilst we study these things. And please um, give grace to all of us as we study your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Isaiah chapter 28 starts with, Ah, you can hear the word woe, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Mm -hmm. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters, he casts down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot. And the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When someone sees it, he swallows it as soon as it is in his hand. In other words, they're going to be gone just like that. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So in that day, hold on a minute, in that day, the day that God restores... God is going to be like that to his people, to the remnant of his people. And now verse 7, these also reel with wine. So now he's back to talking about judgment. Remember me saying with Isaiah, he has two feet, doesn't he? What's he wear on his feet? Judgment and... That, what kind of shoes does he wear? Isaiah wears flip-flops, doesn't he? Yeah, that's it because he flip-flops between judgment and restoration and blessing, doesn't he? 
So judgment, blessing, judgment, blessing. And you, you've got to kind of go, oh, oh, he's, fl he's flip-flopped back to this now. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. Hold on a minute. Now that's going to be really important for us. Take notice of this because he's talking about a time when a people, the people of Israel, would even have priests and prophets who were drunkards. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. This is verse 7. They stumble in giving judgment. What's it like? How drunk are they? Well, verse 8. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. That's how it can be. That's how bad it can get. You've seen it on the streets of London, haven't you? Yeah. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Now, um, the great question when you have a question like this, you're reading the Bible, uh, and it can be really hard sometimes because you're reading and you think, now, who is speaking? Okay, well, right now, if you study this carefully, you'll see that the, the, the voice has changed and the person speaking at the moment are the drunk people, these drunk priests and prophets. To whom will he teach knowledge? They're talking to the prophet of God. And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast? For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For by a people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people now, um, back up a bit for a moment, just try to follow with me. So there's these drunk priests, drunk prophets. They're complete, you would say, in complete rebellion against God. But now here comes Isaiah and he's, he's the prophet and he's prophesying to them and he's prophesying woe to them. And they're mocking him now, okay? So now they're... They're mocking him and they're saying, who's he going who's he going to teach knowledge to? Who's he going to explain the message to babies? And, and then they're mocking his message. They're saying it's precept upon precept, line, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. They're saying it's baby teaching. In fact, when you try to translate the Hebrew here, it's really, really hard because it seems like it seems like to begin with, these words are non-words. Are you with me? What's up? Are you fiddling with the dog? Leave the dog alone. Stick with me. Now, it seems like the, the, the words, I mean, nobody can translate them because they're like, they're like, they're not actually words. They're not used elsewhere in literature. You say, well, what, what kind of words are these? And, but they rhyme like children's words, like na, 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 or yeah, 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 it's something like that. So these, Ailey, lie down. These drunk prophets, is she lying down? Lie down, good girl. These drunk prophets and drunk priests are mocking Isaiah and they're saying to Isaiah, who's he going to teach knowledge to? Who's, who's he going to explain everything to? It's when he teaches, it's like, Precept, na, 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 and here a little, there a little. And now God is going to reply to that now through Isaiah. And he says, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people to whom he has said, this is rest. Give rest to the weary, and this is repose that they should, that they would hear. Yet, yet they would not hear. I mean, he's told them what repentance is. They're supposed to give rest to the weary. They're supposed to repent and look after the defenceless, aren't they? Defend the cause of the widow and the fatherless. 
And he's told them what repentance is like, yet they would not hear. And, and then in verse 13, here comes the judgment of God, and the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So God says to them, you're mocking me. These people in, these drunk priests were mocking him and saying, who's he going to teach knowledge to? And now God says, I've told you how to repent, but you don't, you won't listen. So here comes your judgment. You're going to hit, you're, the word of God to you is going to be like, na 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 na. Ailey, dim shad. Dim shad. Lie down. Lie down. Hey, lie down. Good girl. The word of God to you is going to be like, baby language. You're not going to understand it. It's going to be meaningless and it's going to be meaningless because he's going to speak to you by a people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue. So the sign of God's judgment upon them was, would be that they were hearing the word of God but it would be incomprehensible to them. It would be in a foreign language. It would be someone else saying the word of God to them and it would sound like babyish stuff to them. And, and look, here, here's the proof that it's judgment. In verse 13, the second half of verse 13, it says, that, here's the purpose, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So, get this straight in your mind. The drunk priests, the drunk prophets are mocking God and mocking Isaiah and they're saying, yeah, you, you're just talking nonsense. You ju you, who are you going to teach knowledge to? You're talking baby language. It's like baby language and they're mocking him with that. But then God comes back at them and says, I'll tell you what it's going to be like. I told you how to repent. But because you won't repent, you won't listen, you're going to have a people with strange lips, foreign tongues, speaking the word of God to you, but it's going to sound like baby language to you. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to make any sense. In order that you may go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. Oh, that's, that's a sign of judgment, isn't it? That says that these, when they hear... When, when they are hearing the word of God in foreign languages, it's going to be a sign of judgment. Now, actually, they should have known that because back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that was one of the signs of, of God's punishment on them for disobedience would be that people of, uh, of that they would be dominated and that they would hear foreign languages in their own land would be a sign of God's judgment on them for their disobedience, right? So, now this is very important. You say, why is, this, why is this important? Well, this is important because this passage right here is quoted in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, didn't he? And, and he, it's quoted, Paul says, when he explains what, the New Testament gift of tongues were, he says tongues, for tongues are a sign to unbelievers. You say, how are tongues a sign? A sign of God's He quotes this verse, exactly, a sign of God's judgment. So now, all right, this is the background, okay? Now, to, can you take yourself in your mind to Acts chapter 2? What happened in Acts chapter 2? The day of Pentecost when the tongues of fire descended and rested on the top of the heads of the apostles and there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind and they all started speaking in tongues, tongues in foreign languages. Right? Tongues of foreign languages, not babble. But, <laughs> but they, they were all speaking in foreign languages. Now they were in Jerusalem, they were all Jews. But suddenly in Jerusalem... There was the sound of people speaking the word of God. They were speak, telling out the praises of God. But they were speaking it in foreign languages. 
Now Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's verse 21, you can look at it. He says tongues are a sign, and he explains it's that tongues are a sign for unbelievers. How are tongues a sign for unbelievers? You said it, you got it from the context here. Tongues are a sign of judgment. So how are tongues a sign of judgment? Okay, you're at Pentecost, you're a Jew, and you suddenly hear God, you, you hear the praises of God being spoken in a foreign language that you don't understand. Someone over says, someone over there says, well, that's Arabic, I understand it. And you think, hold on a minute, I'm a Jew, but I'm hearing the word of God in a foreign language. This is a bad sign, this means God is judging us. Okay, that, that's how tongues are a sign. That's what the message to the Jews were was really simple. God is speaking, God is speaking, but he's not speaking to us. Mm. That's really scary. Okay. Mm. Well, we need to speed up, don't we? But that was a, this is such a crucial passage. You've got to understand this. And um, people misunderstand it. People fail to understand this. And then they actually totally misinterpret what tongues are in the New Testament. But there we are, by the way. Chapter 28 verse 14 therefore hear the word of the Lord you scoffers you, who rule this people in Jerusalem because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with shale we have an agreement when an over when the overwhelming whip passes through it will not come to us for we have made lies our refuge and in falsehood we've taken shelter Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure, of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with shale will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. These, these people thought they'd managed to kind of come to some arrangement whereby they were going to escape. God says you're not going to escape. As often as it passes through, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass through, and day and day by day and by night, and it will be sheer terror to understand the message. For the, this is what it's going to be like, by the way. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on, and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. What a horrible picture. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim. As in the valley of Gibeon, he will be aroused. To do his deed, strange is his deed. And work his work, alien is his work. Now therefore do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. Give ear and hear my voice, give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, sow cumin, and put in wheat in rows, and barley in its proper place, and emmer as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When, the, when he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. I think you could just summarize all of that by saying the Lord knows 
how to judge. God knows, just like farmers know, how much to thresh the, the grain to get it out of, get the wheat out from the chaff and separate it. They, they know how to, to do that and they don't, do, they don't keep doing that forever and ever until it's crushed. They, they do it so far and when they see that all the grain has come out, they stop, don't they? What, what it's saying is God, God knows how to judge and how to bring about his purposes by judgment. And he knows exactly uh, how, to, how to judge the wicked so that he separates the wheat from the chaff and he can destroy the chaff and save the wheat. He knows how to judge the wicked and save the righteous. Isn't that good? Here we go again, verse chapter 29. Ah, Ariel, Ariel. So you could say, woe, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped. Add year to year. Let the feasts run their round. Yet I will distress Ariel. And there shall be moaning and lamentation. And she shall be to me like an, like an Ariel. An Ariel um, is like a, a, a lion of God or a hero, it says. Um, and, and the, but the picture here is of Jerusalem. That becomes very clear, look. And I will encamp against you all around and will besiege you with towers and I will raise siege works against you and you will be brought low. From the earth you shall speak and from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost. And from the dust your speech shall whisper. But the multitude of your foreign foes shall be like small dust, and the multitude of ruth the ruthless like passing chaff. And in an instant, suddenly you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earth and with earthquake and great noise with whirlwind and tempest and a flame of devouring fire and the multitude of the nations that fight against Ariel, all that fight against her and, and her stronghold and distress her shall be like a dream, a vision of the night, as when a hungry man dreams that he is eating and awakes with his hunger not satisfied, or as when a thirsty man dreams he is drinking and awakes faint with his thirst not quenched, so shall the multitudes of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Isn't that incredible? Because obviously this is a prophecy about Jerusalem, and it's saying that they're going to be is going to be surrounded um, by um, enemies and God himself is going to be behind it. He's going to surround them. He's going to bring them low. Um, but then he's going to fight against these enemies. And you're like, what is God doing? Why would God bring enemies against Jerusalem? Maybe they're going to trust him in the end. Uh -huh. So actually this happened, didn't it? Remember the Assyrians came? Have we got there yet? No, we're going to get there in, I in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Chapter 36, we got there in Kings, but we haven't actually read the whole story yet, have we? So it's actually going to be Sennacherib and his army, and he's going to come right to the gates, and he's going to be surrounding them, but then God's going to do this and send them all away again. Anyway, actually this is an interesting picture because this whole scene is going to be repeated at the end of time, when the Lord brings all the nations to surround Jerusalem and then delivers them. Anyway, verse 9. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and has covered your heads, the seers, the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. 
You know, they, when they say a book that is sealed, they dealt with scrolls, didn't they? And, and when they sealed a scroll, you, if you rolled up a scroll and you had a nice scroll, and then you put a wax seal on the end, you've, you've sealed it shut. You can only read it if it, you break the seal, right? Um, and that's what, what he's saying here. He's talking about the, the, the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. You, God is giving them the vision of it all, but they just can't, they can't get it, can they? Mm. And when they read it, they say, I can't, because it's sealed. And, and when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. Verse 13, and the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their heart hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men therefore behold i will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning, men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the one, Holy One of Israel. Read the next verse for me, Karis. The shall come to nothing. Good, okay. Just checking that you're, you're following. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Okay, let's just pause for a second there. We don't, we don't want to spend long on this. But some of this is very clearly applied to the first coming. Do you remember Jesus said this about the people of Israel? Verse 13, this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while well, their hearts are far from me. Jesus applied that to the generation of Jews when he was alive, right? When he was there. He's still alive. But when he was on earth, that's what he said about them. And isn't it interesting? Look, in verse 18, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. And that's what happened when Jesus came, wasn't it? Blind people, literally blind in their eyes, could see, but also the Lord was opening the eyes of the spiritually blind, wasn't he? So that they could understand his word. And the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. And you think, wonderful, this is the first coming. And then... Hold on a minute, verse 20. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer shall cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Mm. And that didn't happen in the first coming, did it? Jesus is going to do that when he comes the second time. This is another one of those prophecies that seems to squash together the first and the second coming. Well, not squash together, it's just it gives both together. And um, we'll see when the Lord comes again, he'll make this all come to pass. Verse 21, who by a word make a man out to be a f an offender and lay a snare for him who reproves at the gate. 
and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. That's the injustice that people perpetuate. Verse 22, Thus, therefore thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name, and they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and, that, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. This is speaking about the revival amongst the Jews at the end of time. How wonderful. Okay, chapter 30, and then we're done. Ah, stubborn children. Remember me saying, what did, what's another way you could translate the word that's translated ah? Very good, woe. Remember me saying this is a whole series of woes. Woe, stubborn children. So, so far we've had um, woe at the beginning of verse 28, uh, chapter 28. Woe, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. All, and he talked to the drunk prophets and priests and the leaders in Israel, in Ephraim, right? And then in chapter 30, uh, 29, sorry, he says, ah, or woe, Ariel, Ariel, and he's talking about Jerusalem, okay? Now, verse chapter 1 in verse 30, he's saying, woe, stubborn children, declares the Lord. And who is he talking about? Let's see. Who carry out a plan, but not mine. Who make an alliance, but not of my spirit. That they may add sin to sin. Who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction. To take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh. Oh, actually, this is now speaking about the people of Israel, isn't it? The people of Judah, the Jews. And he's, God is saying to his people, look, you're looking to Egypt to protect you from the Assyrians and without asking for me for direction. And seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, verse 3, shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame? And the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. For though his officials are at Zoan and his envoys reach Hanes, everyone comes to shame, though a people that cannot profit them, through a people, sorry, through a people that cannot profit them, that brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace. An oracle on the beasts of the Negev through a land of trouble and anguish. From where comes come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the fire, flying fiery serpent? They carry their riches on the backs of donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people that cannot profit them. Egypt's, uh, Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore I have called her Rahab, who sits still, and now, go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to seers, do not see, and to prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions. Isn't that how people are today? I've just got to say it, that people today are quite happy to have someone like Joel Osteen telling them smooth things with a smile. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God only wants what is best for you. You know what I think when I see that smile? The mouth of Sauron. <laughs> Yeah. 
It's really scary, isn't it? But but there are false prophets. False prophets. You realise false prophets only exist. Is it really funny? <laughs> it conjured up quite the image, didn't that? Sorry. But, um, false prophets. Listen, this is serious. False prophets only exist because people want to hear what they have to say. Mm. You know, we were listening to Just William the other day in the car, weren't we? And, and it was very funny to hear him pretending to be a, um, what, what was it, what did they call it? A soothsayer, a fortune teller. Yeah. Fortune teller. Is it? Very, very funny. But um, fortune tellers, I mean, it's so obviously a sham, isn't it? So obviously false. People want to hear it. I mean, we had, a few years ago, we had the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, and his wife, Nancy, consulting astrologers and fortune tellers. And, and I don't know what goes on these days within the Biden household, but that's the kind of thing that, that exists right at the top of society. People are lost, and they're hungry for something. And, 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 but they don't want the truth. Mm. They say to the prophets, don't prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Verse 11. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly and in, in an instant, and its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly that among its fragments not a shard is found with which to take fire from the hearth or dip water out of the system. For thus said the holy, the Lord God, the, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling and you said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore you shall flee away and we shall... Therefore you shall flee away. And they said, We will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore your pursuers shall be swift. Now, what you said a minute ago is, is what, what's happening here. So God was um, warning them that, that they were, they were going to be judged and they were going to be... He was, he was bringing the army to surround Jerusalem in order to make them cry out to him, right? And now what, what God is saying to those people is, look, what I'm telling you is in, in, in returning, that's the word for repenting, this is verse 15, in returning and rest, that's trust in God, right? Mm. So God wants them to repent and trust in him in returning and rest in, in, in re, you could say in repentance and faith you shall be saved. Returning, repenting and rest, trust in repentance and f trust faith you shall be saved in quietness and trust shall be your strength. That's how you can actually be strong if you are be still, trust me, don't panic, don't go to Egypt, don't run for other people to help you. But you were unwilling and you said, no, we'll flee on horses. Therefore you shall flee away. No, we'll, we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore your pursuers shall be swift. God is saying, no, you, if you don't trust me, you're going to run away, but your pursuers are going to be faster than you. That's scary, isn't it? Mm. Verse 17, a thousand shall flee at the threat of one. Where have you heard that before? Mm. Oh yes, Deuteronomy 28. 
the curses for disobedience. At the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Now, flip-flop. Mm. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. You're like, God is pronouncing judgment on them. But he's holding out his arms to them to, to say to re repent. Come on, repent. I'm warning you. I'm going to punish you. Please repent. Mm. That's sad. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion in Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet, more, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more, but your eyes shall see your teacher. Wow. There's a prophecy. You missed that one, have you? Yeah. You need that underlined. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you got to have that. Your eyes shall see your teacher. You're like, what? what? hang on a minute. This is talking about seeing God, but nobody's ever seen God at any time. Hold on a minute. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time, but... God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. <laughs> yeah, the invisible God made known in Jesus Christ, the, the one who was called teacher. Mm -hmm. ah. Verse 21, And your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. And he will give rain for the seed with which you sow, with which you sow the ground and bread, the produce of the ground, which will be rich and plenteous. In that day your livestock will graze in large pastures and the oxen and the donkeys that work the ground will eat seasoned fodder which has been winnowed with a shovel and fork. In other words, it's going to be so much of it, you're going to be giving it to the, giving it to the oxes and the donkeys. And on every lofty mountain and every high hill, there will be brooks running with water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Just again, that hasn't happened yet, has it? Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold, as the light of seven days in the day when the Lord binds up the brokenness of his people and heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. I don't know what that means. Mm. Do you know what that means? I, I, I must, I've underlined it, um, but I should have put a question mark by it. Verse 27, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the peoples a bridle that leads astray. I think they're having a quacking time down there. There goes the dog to look, protect them from the fox that's hopefully not there. It's only eight o'clock. Where are we? Verse 29. You shall have a song as in the night with a holy feast, when a holy feast is kept, and gladness of heart as when one sets out the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And the Lord 
will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and, the, and a flame of devouring fire with a cloudburst and storm and hailstones. The Assyrians will be terror-stricken at the voice of the Lord when he strikes with his rod and every stroke of the appointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be to the sound of tambourines and lyres, battling with brandished arm. He will fight with them, for a burning place has long been prepared. Indeed, for the king it is made ready, its pyre made deep and wide, with fire and wood in abundance, the breath of the Lord like a stream of sulphur kindles it. Whoa. Well, um, okay, we flip-flopped through chapters 28, 29, and 30. What's the picture? God, he's pronouncing woe upon these rebellious children. But at the same time, he's calling to them and appealing to them promising them mercy if only they repent and also promising them that one day they will repent and will have mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to help us to trust you. Help us to learn to trust you in quietness and um, rest, in, 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 in repentance and rest in repentance and trust. Lord, we pray that we would, we would trust you and learn these lessons, not to turn to ungodly helps uh, for aid. We, we pray for your, your help day by day that we would walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, here come the ducks. Welcome to our home. One day we'll give you a tour of the farm. But for now, it's not a farm, it's just our backyard. But it's a, it's a bit of a mess at the moment. We're, it's, it's more of a building site than anything else at the minute. But We'll say goodbye for now. We'll say God bless you and we'll say God willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you, camera lady.